My name is Jerry Schreck. I'm the National Conference Coordinator for Chef to Chef, and I'm also the Executive Chef at Marion Golf Club in Ardmore, PA. Um, every year, we like to recognize the teams that make this all happen on site, and this year's is no different. Um, everyone in this room realizes how much time and effort is needed to pull off an event of this from the culinary side. When, planning, when the planning team arrived and visited in October, Chef Marc Ossier was still new, and he did an incredible job presenting what he wanted to do for us. Right now, I'd like to thank Chef Marc, his team, the entire staff here at the Hilton New Orleans Riverside for what will be our best chef to chef to date. Let's give him a big round of applause. Great job. Thank you so much for all the hard work that lamb shank was to die for. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Come a long way since 2009 in Red Rock with 55 attendees and the talent in this room is incredible. I'm looking down at this table and I'm going, wow. So um, for the first time, I'd like to hand out some things and offer a little stats. Um, who in here would like to tell me what's, how many states are represented? You saw the pinpoints, but just yell it out. How, how many states? Who said 38? What state has the most chefs here? Who said Illinois? We have two international attendees here tonight from Ottawa, Ontario, from the Brook Street organization. Travis Skinner and Clifford Linus, are they here? These presents are from my golf professional. I thought it would be cool to do so. You got a Marion hat. They're over there. Okay, and now for the chef who traveled the furthest, 2,700 miles from Vancouver, British Columbia, from the Arbutus Club, Michael Kozoulis. And the moment you've all been waiting for, the chef that traveled six miles, 17 minutes, in light traffic on US 90 and Palmetto Street. Valicia Brooks here? <laughs> From Matier, Matier Country Club. Now on to our keynote speaker and the chef that we thought would be most appropriate to introduce him. Charles Carroll is a longtime friend of Chef to Chef and has given a keynote address in San Antonio in 2014 and was and represented in 2010 in Palm Beach. And really, he's helped us every year do what we have to do. He's consulted us, and um, it's a pleasure having him here with his podcast. And, and thank you, Charles, for all you do. Charles Carroll. Thank you, Jerry. It's always a pleasure to be here. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you can't go wrong with a, with a room full of club chefs, am I right? Come on, I mean, we're all club chefs, so uh, it's always uh, exciting to be here. You know, Jerry asked me if I could help out, and if I could uh, introduce uh, Chef John Foltz, and I said, sure, you know, anything I could do to help, I know how much work that goes into putting on a, on a presentation like this. So hats off to all you guys. I know how much work, this, this is a really amazing event, and it's always a pleasure to be here. So I said, of course, I'll, I'll uh, help out with uh, Chef John Foltz. But the truth of the matter is, you know, I went on the internet and I was looking around and just, 
there's just really not a lot about the guy out there. You know, I mean, I, I searched and I looked on the uh, internet and I didn't see a whole lot. And, um, but I did find a couple of things, so um, I'll share what I found. Um, he, do, he does have a restaurant, I'm pretty sure of that. He's got a restaurant that's open right now, so that's, I think it's going pretty well. And uh, he, he do, I'm, I'm pretty sure he has a book out. He has a book. And if you haven't got it there, I'm sure he'll probably talk about the book that's coming up. And I think, I think it's going pretty well. And uh, just the only other thing I found out was there is, uh, I think there was a local newspaper that did an article about John a few years back. And uh, other than that, there's, you know, it's just really not a lot of awards or... Charles? Charles. It's tons of accolades. Oh, shit. I thought... <laughs> Charles. I thought it was my... Yes, it Look was up at the screen. What's, what's that? That's, oh, those are awards? Those are awards from... Those are, those are all awards that John Fultz received? All of them. Oh, and that's, that's a vice president? And then, oh, a couple other presidents? Yes. Okay, so that's John, too. Let me look. Okay, the Pope. All right. All right, Jerry, I'm sorry. Man, let me look at look. Let me see. I got another another piece of paper here. I'm sorry, Jerry. I won't I won't let you down. Let me let me start over. <clears throat> Chef John Foltz with the Pope. <laughs> um John started his career at the Howard Johnson's restaurant in Baton Rouge. I want you I want you to pay attention to this this uh year. 1970. 1970. Okay, so pay attention to that. He went on to work in the hotel business before opening his first restaurant in 1976. 76, six years after he started his culinary journey. Six years. It took him six years to open his first restaurant. What a slacker. I mean, I mean, <laughs> John, what the hell took you so long on that one? Chef John Fultz is an entrepreneur with interests ranging from restaurateur to manufacturing and che cheese maker to educator. And I'd also like to add to this uh, culinary historian, uh, which is amazing. I mean, for crying out loud, the guy produces rum in bourbon, right? And he doesn't even drink rum or bourbon. I mean, who does that, right? I mean, this is John Fultz. His enterprises range from pastry manufacturing, product man manufacturing, catering in his plantation, White Oak, as well as all around the world. Rest the uh, Restaurant Revolution, so he does have, a re I, I got that part right, he has a Restaurant Revolution at the Royal Sinestra, uh, Sinestra Hotel in New Orleans, and also Seafood Revolution in Jackson, Mississippi. He teaches at a, at a school, uh, what's the name of that school? It's, um, it's uh, the John Fultz Culinary Institute in Nichols State, that's what it is, I, I, I forgot about that for a second, in Thibodeau. Of course, it's John Foles Culinary Institute. And he's produced a PBS show, A Taste of Louisiana, through Louisiana Public Broadcasting in Baton Rouge. And I want to say, John has spent 30 years or more. What an amazing... Who, who's done anything more than 30 years? So he's done that show for more than 30 years. His USDA food manufacturing facility in Donaldsonville creates uh, unique food items uh, for restaurants around the world, including TJ Fridays and Cracker Barrel and the Shake Shack, just to name a few, and there's a shit ton of others, a place that he, that he produces for all around the world, right? His catering division has created special events in open restaurants from places like the Great Wall of China. Great Wall of China, everybody. <laughs> the Vatican to the U.S. Embass uh, ambassador's home in Helsinki in Finland, the in International Olympics in London, Beijing, Paris, Moscow, Italy, you know, all the typical places that we all open restaurants at, you know, the simple places, pretty much one of the mill locations. His passion for seven primary nations that settled Louisiana and influenced our culture and cuisine has given rise to the plethora of cookbooks. So I was, I was there's a few other cookbooks out there. Most notable were the Big Book series, the Encyclopedia of Cajun Creole Cuisine in its 15th printing, After the Hunt, which won the Louisiana Literary Award, Hooks, Lies, and Alibis. A lot of you guys out there, fishermen, can relate to that one. Paying tribute to Louisiana's fishermen and seafood industry. And can you dig it? 
uh, elevating vegetable to the culinary masterpieces worthy of center of the plate prestige, which won the International Benny Award, which is in 2015. John has been past president or is past president of the American Culinary Federation, past president of distinguished restaurants in North America, and past presidents of the resource uh, research chefs association you know on a spare time you know those are just simple things to do when you don't when you're not very busy literally john faults has received every award known to the hospitality field he is louisiana's culinary ambassador of the world and i'm really really proud uh, to call him a dear friend and mentor over 30 years and it's very emotional for me to be up here. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would really wish if you would get on your feet and give this guy a hero's welcome to the legendary Chef John Foltz. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, how, can I, how can I even begin uh, to thank you for the invitation to be here tonight uh, to just chat a little bit about a culinary journey, not necessarily my only culinary journey, but yours uh, as well. Uh, I kind of view my journey as a journey of possibilities. And, uh, and I love to, to talk to young, uh, young chefs. I, I have my own culinary school at Nichols State University, uh, which, uh, uh, which Charles just uh, uh, mentioned. And we're in our 20th year there. We have 400 students, uh, all Bachelor of Science culinarians, uh, and the only uh, school in the United States that actually gives a college degree that's transferable credits across the country at that school. So it's a unique uh, facility that the state. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, but, but, but you know, guys, where, where, where did this journey all begin? Uh, you know, all of us have a starting point in our lives. And uh, when we look back uh, at it, uh, we kind of look at all the, uh, the, the, ups and the downs in our career, where, where did we really get to a point where we thought we succeeded? At the same time, where did we fail? How could we have done better? Uh, that's the journey I've taken. Uh, I come from the swamps of Louisiana, as you can tell from this accent, right? Uh, uh, good, good shit in the swamps of Louisiana, let me tell you. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, my, my father was a Cajun trapper. I want you to think about that for a minute, a Cajun trapper. Our family spoke French, uh, Cajun French. The Cajuns arrived in Louisiana in 1765, and these men uh, would go into the swamps to set their traps, uh, catch furs, and we didn't have January, February, March, April, things like that in our, uh, in our world. We had crawfish season, crab season, squirrel season, rabbit, you know. Uh, and my father would go out in November into the swamps, into their trapper's cabin, and he would come out of the swamps on Trapper's Christmas, February the 25th. And they'd bring the packs you've seen in some of these old movies where they'd come with the packs of furs on their back and they'd lay them out. And uh, we had great merchants who would buy those furs, Jewish merchants from Alsace Lorraine who had come in uh, they were French-speaking, we were French-speaking. So they trusted each other, and uh, they made great business together. And the trappers had a code. If you caught it and you skinned it, you ate it. So we had no pantries. Uh, we had no refrigeration. So our food, now I'm talking about from 1947. I was born in 1946. I look pretty good for being born in 1946. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, y'all clap on my when I die the same amount, okay, y'all? Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we ate, uh, so we learned to cook at the cast iron pots of the Cajun trappers. That's where we learned to cook. So the only animal we didn't eat, somebody asked me, an interviewer asked me the other day, did you eat every animal you caught? I said, everyone except mink. Mink brought the largest amount of money on the furs, but it wasn't an edible 
uh, animal. <clears throat> and Charles, we were just talking about my annual butchery. I do a big butchering at White Oak Plantation every year. We just did it last weekend, and we bring in 375 butchers and chefs from all over the United States come to my property in Baton Rouge. They were there last Friday, Saturday, and they left on Sunday. Uh, and, yeah, you, you know, and, and one of the dishes, because in the butchery, uh, 10 Cajun families would come together in my world, and each one of them had a pig. And one had a little pig, and one had a bigger pig, and one had a bigger pig. So we would always slaughter the last one. <clears throat> and the children had to help with the slaughtering, so we knew how to do that early, early on. And we knew how to make all of these, uh, all of these uh, different dishes because we had learned to do the dishes of these wild animals in the swamp. So all of my butchers came to Louisiana this uh, past uh, weekend, and in the middle there's boucherie tables here, and there's boucherie tables here with all of the pigs being, uh, you know, turned into different kind of meats while the butchers, and it's, it's preserving tradition, so it's all Cajun uh, boucherie. <clears throat> but in the middle is the cooks feeding the butchers. And they're feeding the butchers the food I just talked to you about. Oh, yeah. I see you shaking your head. You never ate <clears throat> a raccoon stew. But I tell you what, raccoon stew. Every, when a raccoon sees a Cajun, it's getting the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we are about preserving traditions. My company is all about making sure that the great things we're doing in culinary today, the most fabulous work that we're doing to elevate and make easier the processes in the kitchen where uh, these young, very talented cooks who are coming up are now looking for less hours in the kitchen, they're looking for more creativity, et cetera, et cetera, which we all understand. I'm on the other side of that world. My world is making sure we don't lose all of that because that's the most important thing to me is that we're preserving the traditions that got all of us here as uh, chefs in, our, in whatever environment you're in to make sure that we never lose the wise and the hows of culinary. That's very, very important. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, and one of the things that's important to me is that my culinary students at, uh, at Nickel State, when they graduate on their fourth year, the last year in my school is the year that I'm teaching those students. I'm teaching uh, uh, eight classes uh, in that school, and all of it is the hardcore Cajun and Creole traditions of, uh, of dining and uh, of, of, uh, of catching food and dining. Every one of those, and I tell my students when they're coming in as freshmen, Every great culinary, in, uh, culinary school in America is putting out great young chefs. Every one of them. So we're not competing against each other. But if you want to come to a school where we're putting out great stuff like everybody else, and then in your senior year, you're becoming an ambassador. You're becoming uh, an authority on the historic cuisine of Cajun and Creole and preserving it you're going to come to my school because that's where you're going to get it. And not only that, but the other six nations that founded Louisiana in 1700. You're going to learn the cuisine of France and Spain, Native America, English, uh, German, all the way to the Italians, the Sicilians who came over in the uh, uh, 1850s. That's what I really care about. What I really care about, I want to know what that Spaniard, when he walked off of a ship in Louisiana in 1765, I want to know what did he bring with him? What did the woman on that boat, what was she thinking about how they were going to live and how they, that's what, burn, that's what makes my blood boil, to try to make sure that I understand when the Italians left uh, Sicily after the reunification movement failed in the 1860s and, uh, in, and in Louisiana slavery had just been abolished after the Civil War and we needed labor and all of a sudden the Italian fishermen from uh, the Sicilian fishermen were looking to get out of Sicily and for $40 they came to Louisiana and they brought with them their families and their technique and all of that took the place of the slaves who now were free and could become uh, uh, paid workers 
and the Italians and the Africans came together. Imagine that cuisine that was built between the two of them. So these are the kind of things that really uh, 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 I think about every single day. And out of that comes Chef John Falls and Company and all of our divisions. And my company is made up of our, obviously, our restaurant division. And the restaurant division we do, uh, in fact, is the new airport uh, here in New Orleans, which they're just building. I'm going to have the largest restaurant in there, and it will be a historically oriented restaurant. So you'll be able to walk into that restaurant and take food out in crushed bags that you can take with you on a plane or pick them up when you land. But it's all about the historic cuisine of Louisiana. Not raccoon. The airport wouldn't let me put it in. Delaware and North said no. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I want to make sure that when they walk into my restaurant in the airport in New Orleans, they're going to say, wow, look at this. And that's important to me. So our, our, um, our division that actually creates food for other companies, uh, our, the restaurant company, uh, which is very active in my Revolution brand. Uh, at the same time, we have our manufacturing division, our USDA manufacturing division, which is now 22 years old. And uh, like any manufacturers in the room, I know Michael's uh, Michael here, my, my good friend Michael Miner's here, and we've been such close friends for so long. I've learned so much from him in the world of manufacturing. Uh, but we ship food to, I think, about right now, about 18 countries every single day. Uh, out of my USDA facility in Donaldsonville. And it's foods that these companies either hire us to make or they give us formulation. But in most, part, most times it's, ah, oh, you know, we're kind of thinking about this. And then, of course, my R&D department comes in and, and uh, picks that up. Uh, the catering division, as I mentioned, at White Oak Plantation, I bought the plantation home back in the early 90s, and it's 35 acres, and now I finally transformed it into what I want it to be, a great educational facility. I want chefs like the butchers who came in last weekend from all over the, the country. I want them to see what that 1800 smokehouse looked like. Charles, you've seen it. You've walked in and smelled that cypress wood that's sitting in there. Uh, and this smokehouse has been smoking since the 1700s. Imagine. So when I walk into that smokehouse, oh, I have a game changer over here. Oh, I have, of course I do. We all have to have modern, uh, modern technique in our kitchens, obviously. But I let my chefs thrive on that, and then I suck them out and say, come stand in this 1700 smokehouse. And let me compare your own do it and my own do it, okay, for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the restaurant division is uh, the catering division. We cater all over the world, as Charles, Charles said. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been doing a lot of food for companies uh, from, uh, from the catering division, like when the, the United States Olympic team called us, uh, United States, uh, not culinary, but Olympics, called us in. I've done the second Olympics for the United States, setting up the kitchens, setting up the menus, feeding a 1,000 athletes a day, and all gold medalists from every other country in the Olympics. And for the last two Olympics, my company was hired to do that. So we had to create all the food in Domisonville, put all of that food on 18-wheelers, ship it into the belly of airplanes, fly it to the international zones, and have our people there to check it as it came off. And the worst one of all was London a couple of years ago with all of the terrorist attacks. Every piece of food I shipped to London for a thousand meals a day was put in quarantine until they could come. And they said, what is this et to faith, faith stuff? What is that? <laughs> Get a guard over here, quick. <clears throat> but so we do have challenges as well in our catering division and we do cater globally. So uh, we're called at any given time to load up food and shoot from my manufacturing plant or from the R&D team to the manufacturing plant to uh, the world stage. So we do a fair amount of that as well. Uh, then we have the bakery division, which <laughs> Charles mentioned. Actually, I met my baker. The head of my bakery division was working at the, was, uh, uh, was at the Balsam's Grand Resort with Charles as a young cook. Uh, after he finished there, then he went to the Duquesne Club in Pittsburgh and went to work over there uh, with um, that great chef. And then from there, I hired him 21 years ago to build my bakery division. And he built the bakery division, and he's still there as my executive pastry chef 22 years later. 
and his team produces. Absolutely, you know. Uh, I'm very proud of that. <clears throat> um, I've learned a long time ago about something that was an innate characteristic in my home as a young Cajun child. And that is, you have to respect the people around you. And one of the things that I hate most and the things that I'm going to react to most is when I hear one of my chefs or one of the sous chefs or one of, it doesn't matter if they're in my units and I see people just talking down to somebody, I'll walk right in the middle of them and saying, you're destroying a team here and it doesn't work in John Falls and company. We do not destroy teams, we build teams. So what's the problem? What's the problem? Did somebody steal your car or what? Tell me what, it, tell me what went on. And it's always nothing. It's always just nothing. But the fact that I stepped in and noticed all of a sudden made them aware of, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have, you know, okay. Because our kitchens are powder kegs like everybody else's. You just have to make sure that everybody's uh, working within a, in a comfortable uh, area. So our catering division is, can be quite, quite hectic. Pastry division can be as hectic. And again, we ship pastries as well for companies. Where, where do we ship these from? Companies who call and have us R&D product farm, just like any other manufacturing company. Uh, the difference is that there was, there was very few. And when, my, when the miners uh, came about, and I was really intrigued by what Michael and their team were doing at, uh, when his father uh, was uh, working in the bases, uh, I was really intrigued in authenticating real food in a manufacturing environment. And when I got my first kettle, uh, my first kettle to produce food, I, I just backed away from it. I said, you, I, you can't cook anything good in that. <laughs> you can't do it. I said, I won't, I won't even attempt it. You know, I'd have to put too much stuff in there to make it taste good. So I kind of did this, you know. And then one of my guys came up to me and said, yeah, but John, we have this million dollar contract. I said, fill that son of a bitch up. <laughs> You know, so <laughs> we learned, <laughs> we learned, we adapted very, very quickly. Uh, so, uh, and I built my, US, my, built my new USDA plant uh, in, uh, in Donaldsonville where we hire a lot of, of uh, African-American workers who are now making a transition from sugarcane and farming into food manufacturing. And we're very proud of that as well. Uh, and then from that, of course, we have the media division. I know most of you see my shows. Uh, I've been on national PBS since 1988, and my shows still air in most of your uh, areas of Taste of Louisiana. Uh, then I also do every week, uh, I do shows for ABC, and I do shows for Fox uh, that goes through their networks across the country, but we have no, uh, we don't know who, where, what. There, there are three, three to four minute spots that go out across those two networks. The great thing about that, guys and ladies, I pay for no advertising. I want you to think about that. You know the cost in your, in your own operations to market your company? Think about it from the ownership level. We have not spent one cent on marketing in 20 years. It's all free. All free. <clears throat> uh, our publishing division, not only do we publish our own books, we have 12 at this point, and the big book series you're talking about is the encyclopedia series. We decided that we should devote five years to create the, uh, uh, just the, uh, the authoritative work on Cajun cuisine in the uh, arena of uh, the base cuisine, Cajun Creole, then move to the specialties. Uh, after the hunt is the history of hunting from the time of the founding of Louisiana all the way to modern day. What were the animals they were killing? How were they doing it? How were they cooking? What they were doing with the pelts? How, did, how was it commerce and industry, etc.? And that book won a, a National Book Award. And then from that, we went to uh, uh, Hooks, Lies, and Alibis, the History of Fishing. And that book also won a national award. And we did the same thing. We went back to the, uh, to the Native Americans making fish hooks out of the, the, the ribs of a catfish. All, all the way back to that. 
and then to the modern day fisheries of uh, Louisiana. Uh, and then the last one, can you dig it? The history of vegetable growing and, vet, and as the vegetable uh, industry grew in Louisiana. Uh, so I think you can see from what I'm saying, our hands touch a lot of things, but it's all food. We don't know anything about anything that's not food. We don't. My whole team uh, in, my, in my corporate office now, which is about 100 uh, people between media and everything else, all they know is food. That's all they think about. Uh, when a new person is hired and they come in and said, Chef, you know, I think we can do this and that. I said, is it food? <laughs> oh, is this a food company? It's a food company. All we know is food. Stay in our wheelhouse. So that's the way we've been able to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, and then at some point in time, I guess people ask me more than anything else, Charles. Uh, we had this conversation one day. People say, if of all the things you do and all the companies you have, and I might mention, and I, all, and I always mention this with a certain amount of humility because I'm, I am, and I mean this very sincerely. I get emotional about it. In fact, I'm very humble about the gifts that God has given me. I've done nothing on my own. Nothing. I've had a lot of great people. I've had a lot of fabulous people who's donated uh, their time, their efforts, and dedicated their lives to my mission. At the same time, I have, uh, Charles, you know this for a fact, and I want you all to listen to this. My seven vice presidents that run seven divisions of my company have been with my company over 25 years. Think about that. Because I learned early on, I cannot do anything, including changing a roll of toilet paper without them. And that is the secret to everybody's success, is the pride the staff has, not of the company, but of the ownership and the managers. Do they care about me? That's what they want to know. I'll kill myself making that bucket or something, but do you know I did it? Are you proud that I did a good job? I walk around my plant, and it's just one of the places I have to walk. I walk around my plant, and I hug everybody I see. I hug everybody I see. I'll have, I'll have them to the point now where I'm walking in, they come like this. <laughs> it's true. I love, I have my African-American help in, in Donaldsonville, where my, the, one of the largest parts of my company are, and they're all African-American sugarcane workers who have now made a transition to manufacturing. Now they have full benefits and they have all of these things, and I want them to know how much I appreciate the effort for them to do what they're doing today because without them, we can really do nothing. So, you know, with that, uh, I started at some point to answer the call to bring the story of our company internationally. Charles uh, made a couple of uh, references to my openings around the, the country. I've opened my restaurant in 13 countries. The first country I opened my restaurant in, when I look back at it, we had no money, Zero money. And I'll tell you how it started. On New Year's Eve, I was sitting at my restaurant back in about 19, I think it was about 1985. My wife and I were having a glass of champagne. We both worked like animals. I mean, we never stopped. And she was working as hard as I was. And we were drinking a glass of champagne at midnight. And uh, I started to complain about something. And I'll tell you what I was complaining about. My good friend Paul Prudhomme had just gone to New York and cooked blackened redfish. You remember that? Yeah. And the news media went crazy. And I told my wife, I said, what that crap's all about? <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? I said, but putting Cajun season on a piece of fish and throwing it on a grill in New York's going crazy? I mean, that's employee lunch. 
My wife says, it's your employee lunch. It's Paul's money. That's what she said. <laughs> she said, so keep eating your lunch. I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, I want you to shut up and quit complaining about it. And if you want to bring authentic Cajun cuisine to the world, do what Paul's doing. He's bringing authentic Creole cuisine to the world. Just do what he's doing. I said, but we don't have any money. Paul does. She said, you know what? Then that's your problem. You figure out how to do it. That's your problem. That's my wife. That's your And you know what? She was right. Well, I figured it out. I started sending some letters out to different companies around the, the world. Started with Japan because I just happened to know a chef there. And I said, if you want a, uh, some black and red fish that my good friend Paul Prudhomme stole from me, then I'm, <laughs> I'd like to come to Japan and show y'all how to do it. Well, I'd be doggone if they didn't come to my restaurant, two Japanese owners of a hotel, the Clio Court in Fukuoka, Japan, came to my restaurant and said, we're very interested in Kajun. I'll never forget, he said, Kajun cuisine. Maybe you come to Japan. I said, maybe we leave now. You know? <laughs> I, I opened my first restaurant in Japan in uh, 1985 the Clio Court, and then I ended up opening two more restaurants for them. Uh, and from there, opened up my world excursion to open my restaurants. And But my goal was to open it in places that nobody else could really, uh, so they could experience the cuisine of South Louisiana. Uh, I had been petitioning the Soviets for many years to allow me to bring a restaurant to the Soviet Union. I never got an answer, never got an answer, never got an answer, never got an answer, naturally. Then one day, a knock on my door at the restaurant, and my hostess came to the kitchen, and she said, Chef, there's a, two guys out here, and they need to see you, and they don't speak English well. I said, well, neither do we, so what are you complaining? <laughs> <coughs> I said, that's my people. So I thought it might have been an uncle of mine or something, you know. Uh, I walk out there, it's two guys from the Soviet embassy in Washington. And they said, you petitioned the Soviets to maybe venture in Moscow. I said, that's me. They said, two tickets, our flight. You come to Moscow, we discuss. That was it, the whole conversation. The whole conversation. Not who are you going to see? Not what are we going to do? Not how much money is it going to cost? None of that. You come, we discuss in Moscow. Two tickets, our flight. Well, let me tell you what. They gave me five days to get on air flight, and I could have gone the next morning. I was ready to go. I mean, one other guy went. We flew to Moscow on air flight. Y'all never flew air flight, did you? Air flight, the official airline of the Soviet Union, before the fall of the Soviet Union. I'm talking about when I'm the only person on air flight that doesn't have a cage with chickens on top of my seat, <laughs> leaving out of New York. Babushkas and everything else getting out of and I'm sitting on that plane going to Moscow and not who am I going to see who am I going to talk to what are they going to do or am I coming back <laughs> no cell phones no computers remember no cell phones no computers I just told my wife when I left I gave her a big hug I said baby I don't have a clue where I'm going but you'll be the first person to know when I get there well, then when I got there, I couldn't make a long-distance call out of Russia. <laughs> she thought I was dead, I guess. But anyway, after four or five days, the Soviets came in at this big round table, and there was seven or eight Soviets over there, me and an interpreter over here, and the guy in charge of the Soviet delegation started screaming, blah, 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 hitting the table, blah, 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 hitting the table. And I'm sitting there just saying, what is going on with this guy? 10, 15 minutes he did that with all these other guys just looking straight ahead like this, all Russian, naturally. He shuts up, he puts his pen down, and he does this, and my interpreter says, 15 minutes later, my interpreter says, he'd like to know what do you want. I said, are you kidding? I said, I want to open a restaurant here. We talked about it a little bit, walked out. The next day we did it again. 
And finally, on the third day, they showed me a restaurant. They showed me the stoves. They showed me the coolers. There was no burners in the stove. They were all gone. There were no burners in the oven. They were all gone. The refrigeration didn't have any condensers in it. The walk-in coolers didn't have doors. But that was the Russian kitchen. I was given at the World Trade Center in Moscow, the biggest building on the Russian River. I said, you know what? I'm going to sign that contract with the Soviets because they can't come get me if I don't come back. <laughs> I got on a plane and flew back to the United States. And I called my senator in Washington, Senator John Bro. I said, you're not going to believe this. I've got a signed contract to open the first foreign restaurant on Soviet soil. And they've given me the date to do it. And I have to rush. I have to find sponsors. I have to get me some money. I didn't have the contact. He said, well, oh, man, that's great. What's the date? I said, May 22nd. Silent. He said, what? I said, May 22nd. He said, John, I want you to come to Washington right away. I said, Washington? I can't come to Washington. I said, John, you have to come to Washington right away. Come now to Washington. At the next airport, you get a ticket to Washington. We're going to pick you up at the airport. Make a real long story short, in the Russell building with all the people around the table, me signing a bunch of papers. They said, John, the Soviets have just given you the most unbelievable thing that nobody in the world knows about. These guys right here are the only ones who know about it. That's why you're signing all those documents right there. You cannot open your mouth. The Soviets are allowing you to come to the Soviet Union and open a restaurant in the White House when Reagan and Gorbachev are going to meet for the first time and they need food. That's why they're bringing you there. All right. We did it. Ferdinand Metz called me just a couple of weeks ago. I was in Florida and Ferdinand Metz called. He said, John, I'm writing a new book on the 10 chefs who changed American cuisine. And I want you to be in it. I said, hell, Ferdinand, you never called me before. Let me look at your notes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, that's what happened that I had nothing to do with. I was just willing to do it. When people ask me, how did you do that? I said, I don't have a clue how I did it, but the success of it was because I was willing to do it when nobody else in the world was. Same thing happened in Beijing when I was awarded the first contract but with the Chinese government to open my restaurant in Beijing in 88. The first American restaurant on Beijing soil, first American restaurant in the Soviet Union. My chef jacket, it's all that was given to me by Gilles Brigard in Paris. My jacket, the first photo with my chefs on the Great Wall of China hangs in his office in Paris. That was the first chef jacket from his company on the Great Wall with a Western chef. Can you imagine that? Incredible. And I, I attribute all of these gifts to desire, the same thing you go to work for every day. You go to work every day wanting to be better. You want to go to, you go to work every day wanting to be inspired. You want to go to work every single day with this I can do it attitude even when you know you can't but you don't want to tell anybody. You know what I mean. That's what we were doing. My mother died when I was seven years old. Some of you know my story. My mother's first child died. And my mother's last child died in 1955 in childbirth, and the child died with her. In the middle were eight children living in a two-room trapper's cabin in the swamps of Louisiana. I want you to envision that. My mother is buried in a little graveyard in St. James Parish, and at the funeral I remember so vividly the undertaker lifted the lid off of the coffin. Daddy picked each one of these babies up to kiss her in the coffin goodbye. I want you to think of what the audience in that graveyard must have thought at that moment. A Cajun trapper and eight babies. The youngest, the ones, the, my mother died in childbirth, remember this, and she had twins 16 months old, a boy and a girl. And the oldest was my sister, nine and a half. 
Daddy picked each one of us up, kissed my mother, they closed the lid, they buried her, we went home. And in those days, families were broken up. This child went to this aunt or uncle. This child went to this godmother. But daddy got us all around this bed in tremendous pain. I can still see his face today. And he got us and gathered us and the little babies who were too small, he laid them on the bed. And he says, I don't want any of y'all to worry. We're going to stay together. We're a family. We're going to stay together. And at almost eight years old, that was a relief that I can't even describe to you right now, that we were going to be a family. Ten days after we buried my mother, a knock on our little cypress door of our cabin in the swamplands. Ten days after we buried my mom, we opened the door. My dad opened the door and they had nine little heads sticking out, you know what? Because nobody ever knocked on a Cajun cabin, you know, what, what are you there for? There's nothing to find in there. And there's this African-American woman standing outside. And my dad said, yes. She said, Mr. Falls, I'm Mary. Mary Fascio. My husband's a butcher. He, he butchers the, the animals back here at the end of that lane. You probably saw him before. My dad said, yeah, I have seen your husband. She says, you know, about a month ago, I was walking down this lane where your house is, this mud road, and it started to drizzle a light rain. This is what this African-American woman is telling my dad with all of us looking out the door. She says, when I walk past your house here, your wife nine months pregnant, is hanging clothes on the line, on the clothesline outside in the rain. And I noticed that everything on the clothesline was a diaper, was a diaper. And I said, that house must be full of babies. She said, I opened the gate and I walked in and I took your mother and I sat her on the little stoop, the little step, and I hung the clothes for her because I knew she was about to have a child. She says, when I got up to leave, she grabbed my hand tight. And she says, what's your name? She says, my name is Mary Fascio. My husband's the butcher down the street. My mother told her, if anything happens to me, would you look in on these children for me? Mary said, absolutely I'll look in on these children, but you just take care of yourself. You'll be all right. Ten days later, my mother died in childbirth. Ten days later, Mary Fascio knocked on the door. She was the only mother we knew. She came into our home raising her own six children came in to raise us eight. She was the best chef I ever knew. Her husband was the most phenomenal butcher I could have ever taken a class from. Didn't matter what the animal was. If glands had to be taken out of these legs, he knew exactly how to show us to get them out. He smoked meats the most. He knew what wood to get out of the swamps for the best smoke. And all of these rough details of Cajun cookery were being poured into us as little children by this African-American genius, Mary Fascio, and her husband, Zum, Z-U-M was his nickname. And they poured knowledge into us while my dad continued to work as much as he could to raise money for us. Mary Fascio is the reason I'm standing here tonight. It's not about the culinary school with my name on it at Nickel State University. It's not about the fact that I've opened restaurants where no man had ever opened them. It's not about the fact that I have a manufacturing plant that 
makes food for companies all over. And Danny Meyer called me and said, I have a little burger I'm having a lot of trouble with, John. I can't make that burger. It's, I just, it won't hold together. It's made with mushrooms. And I said, well, Danny, why are you calling me? He said, well, I've called a lot of manufacturers. Nobody will touch it. And I thought you would. And I said, well, why did you think I'd do that, Danny? He said, because when the World Trade Towers fell and nobody could get food to my restaurants, you shipped it in to me from Louisiana. I didn't ask how you did that. And every Friday, we got a box from you in New York while we went to rubble and smoke. You sent us a box with Cajun music, beads, and food for our staff to have pre-meal. He said, we will never forget that. And I said, call John Falls in Louisiana. That man will do it for us. And I did. I'll make all the shroom burgers today worldwide for Danny Meyer, right? All over the world. And that was 20 years later, right? <laughs> that, that he called me for the mushrooms. My message to y'all tonight in closing is, yeah, we have great companies. <clears throat> We've had struggles, a lot of struggles, just as you do. None of us won't have struggles in our marriages, in our life, in our family, with our children, with our workplace. We live in the real world. This is what we do. We get up every morning just trying to make sure we get through the day feeling good about what we're doing. That's, that's the life we live i never forget when I looked into the records of a town. I went over to um, Chateau Chantilly because I was doing a dinner, the last dinner that Vettel did when he killed himself. Some of you may have been to that dinner in New Orleans uh, that I did last year, the dinner of the century. Was anybody there? I know that ACF and uh, the Shen was there. <clears throat> I went to Chateau Chantilly in Paris and was allowed in to look at all of Vettel's records from the 1600s. And there was a little written statement on there that I found out that I thought Escoffier had written. But Escoffier didn't write it. Vettel wrote it. He said in that little statement, in his records, as he's writing his menus, at Chateau uh, uh, Chantilly, 1671, he's writing, it's two o'clock in the morning. The stoves are fired with coal. We walk to the window and put our face to get the air. It's the best of our day. It's the best of our day. Vatel. I was so inspired when I read that that here's this master from the 1670s doing the same thing we do every day as cooks and chefs. It's two o'clock in the morning, we're at work. We fire up our stoves. We try to walk up to the, ah, give me a little cool air. It's the best of our day. So in closing, I would like to tell you, I have been blessed blessed in a way you cannot imagine and it's you sitting at these tables today who bless me nobody appreciates me more than I the work that you do the quality work you strive to do every single day nobody loves more than I what you do to pass on the tradition of culinary to those rising stars who you see and say She's going to be great. I need to get, I need to make sure she doesn't get away from me. Or, come here, I need to talk to you. You need to think about whether you really want to be in this business or not. These hard conversations. I love the fact that you're here in the city that care for God. The city that care for God. We don't really care about anything other than hospitality, good food, family, and church. That's really what we love most here. The city that care for God. We don't worry about things that we can't control. 
So I want you to know that I love you because I love what you do and you represent the best at what we do in our industry. Everything I've done in my life is because I had a bunch of people just like you pushing me from behind in my own company, striving to be better, wanting to do great, wanting to learn, and then appreciating the fact that I might not be able to pay them the wage they could get if they went to the city. And we built a company on that platform. Today, we're still a self-owned company. We have no partners. We have no investors. I've never had partners or investors in my company except Rick Tramato, who's with me at Revolution Restaurant. It's the only partners I've ever had. My wife is the accountant, and she tells me to stay out of the money. <laughs> I'm the chef. I tell her to stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> and the only problem is she comes into the kitchen anytime she pleases. <laughs> but I stay out of the money. <laughs> Guys, I love you. You know that. Thank you all so much for listening to my message. Thank you all so much.